I don't know where to begin this video. I guess with the question of how much it takes or what does it take to forever change the course of how people interact with a synthesizer. And that sounds extreme and hyperbolic, but as somebody who has played the guitar and piano for most of my life, blending this with this is huge. Now, of course, there are and have been a lot of really cool conceptual instruments in this space. Most of them don't survive for a variety of reasons. I suppose a lot of them are crowdfunded and they don't realize the challenges of trying to get a completely new concept mass produced, but I think most of them are just ideas that unfortunately fall short in the utterly unpredictable and brutal test of real world adoption. And today I am playing with the Expressive E Osmos, which I believe is the first device in a really long time that will pass that brutal test. So the Osmos or Osmos, I'm not sure which is the correct pronunciation, but while I'm mispronouncing things, I suppose we should start with Dr. Lippold Hocken inventing the continuum fingerboard in the early 1980s when he was a University of Illinois student. And the idea was to allow expressive playing far beyond the quantification of a piano keybed. But you can't just make something like this and then plug it into a synthesizer designed to be played with a piano keybed. And this is where Edmund Egan and Christophe Duquesne come in. Hey, look, here they are jamming together at Superbooth a few months ago. You can buy the result of all of this work in the form of the Slim Continuums and a mini version or an Egan Matrix module today from Hawk and Audio. But a lot of this stuff is literally handmade in a basement as a love of labor. It's not mass produced, so it's pretty expensive but this is where Expressive E comes in. So Expressive E came to public fruition around 2015, and a year or two later, they released the Touche, which is one of the most innovative and sensitive and stylish expression controllers one can find. They accompanied the Touche with some physical modeling software, which sounds amazing, by the way, but the long game for this company is a MIDI controller or an instrument that is accessible while delivering this high level of expression. And now that we finally have it, the brutal test of adoption begins. Is it accessible? I told my parents to sit down and try it without telling them much about what it even is. My dad, a guitarist, immediately picked up on being able to play vibrato on the notes, and my mom, who isn't a musician at all, was impossible to tear away from the osmos. Like, my dad wanted to play some more, but she was hogging it from him, and it became a little bit chaotic as they both tried playing at the same time. Seeing that from this position in the music gear industry is a big deal. If you took most of the innovative and amazing devices that you see on this channel or other synth YouTube channels and handed it to a non-synth enthusiast, very understandably, they'd lose interest pretty quickly. Just as if some Somebody handed me a knitting kit or ingredients for a layer cake. I'd be like, cool, I don't know what to do with this stuff. Here you go. You can look up the specs online if you want. It's better to just dive in and hear it. Let's go. When I first heard about this and when I was initially following the development of it, I imagined that it would be transforming my workflow in ways where I could turn a minor chord into a major chord without having to take my hands off the keys. Like I could do this, but this still sounds good. When I play the guitar, I slide up to notes a lot when I could bend up to them, and I think it's just a preference in that moment of musical expression, and in this case, it is the best of both worlds. So nice. I feel like this is the first clav or harpsichord patch I've ever liked on any synth. And I think it's because if you hit the note hard, you get the fundamental, but if you hit it soft, you get this octave up harmonic pluck.
So even though this is one of the most complex sounds synthesis wise that you can get on a consumer <laughs> synthesizer, it is kind of easy to shape it here. So here's just like a cello-ish string sound. And if we go over to playing here, there's something called press glide, which allows us to do this. So I'm not actually vibrating the key, it's just working like normal legato would work on a regular keyboard. But the magic trick here is that I can do this. I'm able to play a chord with this hand. While legating with this one. So over here we could actually customize the distance from the keys so it'll work from farther distances. Crazy. So you're probably curious about the bending and all of that can be adjusted to your liking. By default, it is only one semitone up or down in most patches. We could turn it off entirely. A quarter of a semitone, which doesn't really do anything. Half of a semitone or two semitones. We could go all the way up to 96 semitones. Why anybody would want to do that is beyond me. <laughs> I'm gonna set it back to two here and just play a little chord sequence. And I was probably hitting those a little unevenly, but the reason it sounded in tune is because of stabilization. If we turn that all the way down, You could set your stabilization all the way down and your sensitivity curve to be completely linear. And maybe if you've been playing the Osmos for 50 years, you'd be able to play it in tune, but there's no way that this is gonna sound in tune. <laughs> I never realized how much I'm weighting my fingers to one side or the other until now. It is probably useful for sound design.
The reverb is pretty good. The algorithm is on the upper end of most synthesizers that come with reverb, but it's not going to contend with a really good algorithm on a VST or a pedal. I do like how it has a mode like that that is a little bit more natural, and then you can turn on extend. And that really allows you to dial in the ambient reverb sound. I'm going to be completely honest, the physical modeling engine is really good. It's not the best I've ever heard, but it is the best I've ever heard on a standalone synthesizer, by far. And if this physical modeling engine came out in a piece of hardware that didn't have any sort of crazy revolutionary key bed and just had a normal keyboard or maybe even was a rack unit or a pedal, I would probably spend a hefty amount of money on that, or at least I'd be tempted to, because, again, nothing like it exists. I would assume that one of the main reasons why hardware synths don't typically have physical modeling to this degree is because it's actually a little bit sonically dangerous. So much of what you're hearing right now, to get that tone, requires comb filters or for things to be completely feedback driven. And if one of those parameters just goes a decimal point too high, it will blast your ears with crazy noise. If you're a musician, maybe you've played with an echo or delay pedal and turn the feedback all the way up and then turn the time down and it just made a very loud tone. Imagine a bunch of those looping in and out of one another and that's what you have here. And I would assume that a lot of the patch making process, especially with these macros where you could edit these sounds, was running into those blasts of noise and making sure that the customer doesn't. I just really wanted to try this. I have a fat model D preset. And then I have a looper here. And then I also have a TR6S, which is basically just acting as a metronome for the looper. I'm gonna try and layer expressive monophonic performances to create expressive polyphonic chord stacks. And I'm just improvising, so let's try it. I mean, I guess that turned out how I expected it to. <laughs>
so this half complete patch that I made attempts to adjust to the key that you're playing in and you could play it with only one hand ideally So these were on display at the NAM trade show this year, and somebody I knew was playing with one, and I asked him what he thought, and he said, well, I love the design of the keyboard, but it does seem like a preset machine. And I was like, you have no idea the depth that this goes into the moment you hook it up to a computer. So that was going to lead into a segment where I give you a tutorial on the Egan Matrix. And while I didn't even get that far in the tutorial on the Egan Matrix, this video would have been about 90 minutes long. And I realize we're already at the 20 minute mark. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you some highlights of the Egan Matrix, and then I'm gonna follow up and do streams with the Osmos next to me, and that way it's a little bit more interactive. Did you even know that I have this entire other YouTube channel that streams once a week for two hours, typically on Thursday early evenings Eastern time? Well, now you do. And there's a link in the description and you can also view it right there. So in the future, go to that streaming channel, scroll down and you'll see some Hocken Editor or Egan Matrix stuff. And in the meantime, here are just some highlights of what I recorded. The best way that I could prepare you for an Egan Matrix in its current state is imagine that it's the early 80s and you have a subtractive analog synthesizer and you make some sounds on it and then you get a Yamaha DX7 and then you're like, all right, how do I make sounds on this? <laughs> Type in 0.01, create a formula. Now we have a constant here, but we're going to negative one to positive one. And So yeah, I'm obviously excited about this for a lot of reasons, and I think most of those reasons are from the musician part of my brain rather than the gear-obsessed part of my brain. And I think back to the many, many grueling days of fine-tuning articulation using MIDI CC and key switches on orchestral sample libraries, and it all of a sudden seems archaic. I think that the Egan Matrix is an incredibly fun and deep rabbit hole to spend a very, very long time lost in but I do not think that it is the most accessible interface for most synthesizer users. And even getting it hooked up while you don't need a Max MSP license to run it, you still have to upload a special firmware to get it to run in unison with what you saw on the computer screen in this video. But on the other hand, it is just an interface for a hardware engine, and I assume that soon they'll have a tool where you could download the presets off patch storage and put them on the Osmos without having to go through Max MSP. These are going to be growing pains any time that you have a physical modeling synth engine. But the exciting part is that when you combine a synth engine like this with machine learning that studies the articulation of real instrument performances, I believe that that's where everything in this type of pro audio is headed. But most importantly to me, as a musician, 
I'm just able to express myself better and I can play a single note and have it be angry or sad or playful. And that's something that I can kind of do on the guitar and I've used MIDI guitars to make expressive leads for ages. That's kind of my whole thing. But here is this same expressive capability but with a much larger polyphonic and harmonic palette right next to me as I write music by my computer. If you're wondering, nobody is paying me to make this video. I don't even have an affiliate link. A long time ago, I offered to pay for the Osmos and got this through a lot of persistence. Venus Theory is jealous that I have one, so is Jeremy. My point is, they're not exactly sitting stagnant on the shelves in Guitar Center. It's a hot item and you can't really get your hands on one, unfortunately. It appears that if you really, really wanted one right now and have a ton of expendable income, they're being scalped at a much higher price on Reverb.com and eBay. However, if you pre-ordered one directly from Expressive E right now, you would probably get it by Christmas. And if you have $1,800 to spend, your future self will be very grateful when that package arrives. And this is as of June 15th, if you watch YouTube but don't understand how time chronologically works and watch this in September, don't be mad at me if you can't get one by Christmas. Anyway, even if they did pay me, this channel is a nonprofit organization, so that money would fund future content and research. And if you want to help fund future content and research or join an amazing community with monthly songwriting challenges and loads of unreleased music, audio assets, field recordings, and so on, my Patreon is as little as $1. And we would love to have you. All right, see you later. Bye.